I know you're probably as excited as I am with the topics that we'll be hearing tonight. It's truly my pleasure to introduce the, um, these distinguished speakers to you. First, I have a, a little housekeeping to do, just to kind of explain that um, there's a little bit of a change with the evaluations. So when you, uh, and what, a nice little perk is that you can get two contact um, hours credit as well for attending uh, tonight's lecture. But I ask that you spend special attention when you fill out the evaluation form. They really, um, the American Nurses Association has added a new little question. It's the evaluation of learning. How will you integrate it into your practice? So if you'll sp spend special attention on that. And to get the two contract contact hours, excuse me, you need to stay for the full lecture and the question and answers afterwards. And so how this usually will proceed is each speaker gets about 20 minutes to speak. I know it's short. <laughs> we wish we had more time. But then we'll hold the questions until the end. And so that it, at the end, you can address your questions to the speakers at the end of the, um, the, uh, their presentations. A couple other housekeeping things. I just wanted to mention that none of the speakers have any conflicts of interest to report. So there's here, they're here just with pure science and interest in uh, their patients and um, this great information that they have to share with us. <clears throat> okay, with that, I guess we'll get started. I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker, who's Dr. Anahita Dayum, and she, she uh, is currently working at the Allergy and Immunology Clinic. She's an attending there at the Boston Children's Hospital. Um, she also he is one of the allergist immunologists at the Boston Children's Hospital um, within the medical school. Of, I'm sorry, I gotta start over. <laughs> um, she also is a staff allergist there at Children's, and she's the director of the satellite program of Division of Immunology at the Boston Children's Hospital and the director of the drug desensitization program there. So, with that, I'll let Dr. Dion take that. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So I'm going to start. So this microphone is kind of away from this. Uh, would it still? Oh. Can they still hear? You know what I mean? So I don't know. Can you still hear me if I? Sp okay. So I'm going to start by just um, going over a general overview of allergic reactions, what we call IgE-mediated allergic reactions. Um, so these are kind of uh, you know, the allergic reactions which can lead to more serious ones like for food allergy, anaphylaxis, as opposed to non-IgE mediated which are more of the sensitivities, things like chemicals and things like that. So um, this is how the IgE molecule is formed and basically you initially have a contact with an allergen which could be a food allergen or an environmental allergen like a dust mites or tree pollen, things like that. And these are called the B cells, which are the initial cells that um, interact with that allergen. Then uh, they turn into what we call plasma cells, which generate antibodies. And one of the antibodies that they can generate in the case of allergic reactions is IgE. Then this IgE, attaches to the mast cells. These mast cells, they have receptors for this IgE molecule. And then when these cells are exposed to the allergen again, then the allergen, as you see in, do I have a laser pointer? Well, actually, I can use the mouse. Can you see it when I, yeah, there we go. So um, basically, as you see, the allergen here is cross-linking these two receptors. And then when these two receptors are cross-linked, you have a series, series of reactions which causes mediator release, which are basically molecules that are released and cause the allergic reaction. The most important one of them being histamine, which is uh, pretty mast cell specific. Now, uh, reactions, allergic reactions that are triggered by IgE, they can be classified as immediate and late phase. The immediate reactions, usually they can start within minutes to 30 minutes usually uh, after uh, exposure to the allergen. I have uh, just, you know, uh, provided you with the list of the common 
um, disorders or conditions that um, are linked to the IgE mediated allergy, allergy, mainly the immediate reactions. So allergic rhinitis and allergic conjunctivitis, which are basically your hay fever kind of symptoms, uh, food allergy, and one of our other colleagues is going to talk about food allergy later, so I'm not going to go too much over that. Uh, bee sting allergy, or what we call bee venom allergy, latex allergy, um, allergic urticaria or hives, allergic asthma. Um, asthma, as you know, can be allergic or non-allergic. Um, asthma in children a lot of times is actually allergic. Up to 80% of kids with asthma, they can have allergy to environmental allergens as a trigger. So it's actually very important for kids to be skin tested or undergo allergy evaluation when they have asthma. So if you find that they have a trigger such as dust mite allergy, that can help um, you know, with their asthma, with the management of their asthma. Then allergic drug hypersensitivity, which is drug allergy basically, and anaphylaxis, I just put it there as a general term, and any of the IgE-mediated allergic reactions in the serious case can lead to anaphylaxis, but not all of them. Usually, typically, out of the list listed above, uh, food allergy, bee sting allergy, latex allergy, and drug allergy can lead to anaphylaxis, but your hay fever or asthma will not cause anaphylaxis. Usually environmental allergies don't cause anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is basically your serious life-threatening reaction, and I believe you're gonna go over that in more detail later. So what are some of the symptoms and signs of an immediate reaction? Um, again, because this is a general talk, I just put them all together. But um, it starts with skin reactions, and can be anything from urticaria, which is hives, angioedema, which is swelling, like swelling of the lips or eyelids, uh, and pruritus, which is itching, gastrointestinal, anything from tingling and itching of the mouth, and oropharynx, which is inside the mouth and uh, back of the mouth, vomiting, diarrhea, um, abdominal cramp. Then respiratory, which can start with just your nasal symptoms, which can be nasal congestion, runny nose, post-nasal drip, and also the eye symptoms, red itchy eyes, uh, hoarseness of the voice, which, um, and strider, which is basically difficulty breathing through the upper airways and the noise that it makes, uh, dyspnea, which will be the difficulty uh, breathing, cough, wheezing, and in extreme cases, in anaphylaxis, respiratory arrest, but also in severe asthma, of course, it can lead to respiratory arrest. Cardiovascular, and this is really only involved in anaphylaxis, so that could be hypotension, tachycardia, or a rapid heart rate, and cardiac arrhythmias in the more severe cases. So this is what we call an allergic facies. So you see this child, um, she has dry skin to begin with. You see a little bit of flaking, so that's mild eczema on her face. Then you can also notice that she's mouth breathing, and that's because her nose is congested. So that's one of the signs. Sometimes parents, if you ask them, does your child have nasal congestion, they would say no. But then if you ask them if the child mouth breathes, then they would say yes. So that's one of the symptoms of the nose being, because mouth breathing is not normal. So usually it is a sign of upper airway congestion. Um, and it could sometimes be adenoids also, but nasal congestion alone can cause mouth breathing. Then uh, you see that the eyelids are a little bit swollen and a little bit dark underneath. We call these allergic shiners or infraorbital shiners, so dark circles under the eyes. And then uh, you see these lines, which we call Denny Morgan lines, again, a sign of allergic reaction. And sometimes you also see a horizontal crease on the top of the bridge of the nose here, and that's because the child rubs their nose often, and then they get this little line up there. And this is hives or urticaria. So these are raised lesions. They have these borders that's kind of irregular. And they're usually more clear in the center and uh, darker red on the edges. And the typical hive doesn't last longer than a couple of hours. It can come and go. So it can be in one place in the body and then be seen in another place, but it doesn't typically stay in one area for a long time. 
So what are some of the late phase reactions? So these can be triggered by that IgE molecule that I talked about initially, but then can trigger other cells and then a reaction that keeps going on and cause more inflammation. So some of the examples of that are allergic eosinophilic esophagitis and gastroenteritis. So this is basically chronic inflammation of the esophagus, and, but it can go further down in the GI tract as well. Um, then eczema or atopic dermatitis, some cases of drug allergy or drug hypersensitivity, and some cases of asthma. What are some of the symptoms and signs? Um, so for eosinophilic esophagitis or your GI disorders, could be food refusal, dysphagia, which is difficulty eating and food getting stuck in the throat, vomiting, um, abdominal pain, weight loss. This is a common complaint in kids, what we call failure to thrive in younger kids. Um, and then for eczema, just typical eczema lesions, and for uh, drug allergy or drug rashes. And asthma, we kind of previously discussed the symptoms, wheezing, cough, and all that. So for these patients who have this kind of combination of immediate and late phase reactions, about 40 to 50% of them have IgE to either food and or um, inhalant allergens. So this is just one uh, of the findings that you see when you're doing endoscopy in patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, this concentric rings. Um, so this is what you see grossly when you're doing the endoscopy, but there's other findings too, which I'm not gonna go over them. And this is not the best slide, but um, it's the only one I could find last night just to put it as part of the presentation. But basically you see eosinophils, which are um, cells that are higher in number in this condition, eosinophilic esophagitis. The arrows are supposed to point to them. I mean, you can see it barely. They should be darker red and the number of them are increased in the biopsy of kids. And if you have more than, depending on the studies, five to 15 per what we call high power field, then that's an indication that there's a good chance that this child has eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. And that's atopic dermatitis or eczema. In younger children, toddlers, and infants, it usually involves the face, as you see here, and also the um, extensor surfaces of extremities, which is like the outer parts of the arms and legs, and also their trunk. In older children and adults, it's usually the flexor surfaces, which is basically behind the knees and also uh, inside the elbows. Now, what are some of the diagnostic studies? Um, skin prick testing, skin interdermal testing, specific IgE assays, atopy patch testing, and true test patch testing. Then some general ones, tryptase level, total IgE level, CBC with differential, and then more disease specific studies like chest x-ray and spirometry for asthma, barium swallow and endoscopy for eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, so what's involved in skin prick testing? Basically the skin is pricked with the allergen to which you want to find sensitivity to. And then you measure the size of the reaction 15 to 20 minutes later. There are several um, devices that can be used, and histamine, which is the molecule I showed you initially, that's used as a positive control, so you put that on the skin to make sure that the patient reacts to that. This is one of the devices that we commonly use in children, so it makes the test a lot easier. You see that it has eight prongs with pointy edges, and then these little bottles here, they have the allergen that we want to test them to in it, and then we put a drop of that on each of these wells, and then, uh-oh, sorry, let's see. All right, what happened? Sometimes if you go out of the Just screen, it'll go off. You might have to keep the mouse a little more. Well, let me just go to my, let's go to you. Yeah. Oh, that goes to the next slide. We'll keep that up. Okay, well, here, <laughs> and there we go. No, it still doesn't work. All right, well, you know what? We'll just do it this way. Can you still see? Yes. All right. So uh, basically, um, this is then, it, it gets inverted on the skin, and then we just lift it off. So it just takes a second. So for little kids, it actually makes it a lot easier. And then we wait for 15 minutes to measure the reaction. This is another device that you use for older um, 
adults or uh, I mean for older kids and adults and it just uh, tests each of them individually. Then this is what we measure, the wheel and the flare. So the swelling in the middle is the wheel and the flare is the redness around it. And we want this to be at least three millimeters for this little swelling in the middle and with some surrounding flare. And usually bigger reactions uh, mean more sensitivity, although smaller reactions can uh, indicate uh, significant sensitivity as well. So what is the intradermal testing? With that, we actually inject a little bit of the allergen under the skin. And just like this one, we measure the size. Uh, this is not used for food allergy, but it, use, it is used for drug allergy and also um, some cases of environmental allergies. How much more time do I have? Just I'm done. <laughs> um, if you want to just wrap it up. Um, okay, so that's fine. So, so these are uh, three minutes. Um, maybe at least for the diagnostic studies we can finish those. What do you think? Let me see. Well, this is the ATOP patch testing. So this is more for the delayed reactions uh, for the eosinophilic esophagitis, some cases of eczema. So you actually put the allergen in little wells and then tape it up in the back. And then these are removed 48 hours later. And then uh, basically you read the redness at the site of it. For management quickly, uh, so it's either allergen avoidance, so that would be inhalant, food, or drugs or uh, allergy immunotherapy or desensitization. So for inhalant allergens, which are your dust mites and environmental allergies, we can do allergy shots or it's immunotherapy. Um, for foods, the desensitization, that's still in the research phase. So we are not offering that yet. Bee venom allergy, that again, allergy shots for it work pretty well. Drug desensitization can work really well for patients with drug allergy if they need to have that drug again. And um, they have to need it, and that has to be a first choice for them. Then medications, antihistamines, uh, topical steroids, uh, beta agonists, probiotics, and vitamin D, there's some role for it. Of course, EpiPen and AbbVQ. Um, these are for patients with food allergy. So in summary, um, only a subgroup of conditions categorized as allergy by the population is actually true allergy and IgE-mediated allergy. Along with the history, symptoms, and signs, as well as the physical examination, there are helpful assays available to assess uh, for the accurate diagnosis of these conditions. Uh, treatment and management options vary uh, from avoidance to treatment with medications and or immunotherapy and desensitization. Thank you. <laughs> I know you're going to have a lot of questions uh, later for Dr. Dayom, and I, and I love getting those reports from allergists when I try to um, help manage kids with asthma in my practice, so I love that, that, that in information about what they're allergic to. <clears throat> the next speaker is Dr. Susie Sawyer, and many of you know her as an associate professor here at Regis. Um, she also is in practice in pediatrics in Brockton Pediatric Healthcare. So I'll let Susie get started so I don't. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute, I have to bring this up here. Yep, so just go forward a little. No. Nope. Hold on. Go, go to the full screen and go forward. This is the wrong thing. This is, this yours. is not it now at all. Hold on, let's just end it. Hold on okay. a second. Yeah, and then just go to the other one and get the ones that you have up. Right here. Okay, got it. Okay, fine. Okay, let's see if I can get the full screen. I'm good. Okay, hi, welcome. Um, I'm going to be speaking on the prevalence of food allergies, specifically in children. All right. Oh, good. Okay, to start with food allergy, uh, just to give you some background information and just some definitions as how I was going to start. Um, a food allergy is defined as an adverse effect from a specific immune response that is reproducible on exposure to a given food. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail just regarding the difference between food allergy and food intolerance, and there's a difference. 
okay? And food then is defined as any substance intended for human consumption. It can be drinks, it can be chewing gum, food additives, and any kind of dietary supplement. Whereas a food allergy is really is IgE mediated reaction that is potentially systemic and characteristically rapid in onset. Okay, it's manifested by specifically like by by swelling of the lips, by the mouth, uvula, glottis. Okay, general urticaria, wheezing, um, and severe reactions that can lead to anaphylaxis. So there's a big difference in understanding between a food allergy and a food intolerance. Okay, food intolerance includes any adverse reaction to foods or substances ingested in foods. Um, what it is, it's an abnormal physiologic response. It is not I immune globulin or IgE mediated, and that's the big difference. So certain foods can cause either an allergy or an intolerance, and in many instances, food allergies are confused with, in with food intolerances. Um, and therefore, it's really important that an accurate diagnosis is made because the treatment is different. Okay, and I'm just giving, this is just some examples, say, of a food intolerance. Cow's milk, and everybody is familiar with many, with the allergies, okay? Um, so an example is cow's milk that causes an allergy with an IgE-mediated systemic reaction causes a reaction si si such as urticaria that you would see on an infant's face, like on the cheeks, all right? And that's really, that's a food allergy where cow's milk, cow's milk that causes an intolerance from, uh, say, gastrointestinal response, such as diarrhea or abdominal pain, is really an intolerance to the milk due to the inability to digest lactose. And that's an inability to tolerate the milk protein. That does not mean that it's a, that it's a milk allergy. This is a milk or a food intolerance. So there's a difference there. Um, just to go on al along these same lines, and adver adverse reactions are divided into IgE-mediated and non-IgE-mediated reactions. Um, and so some of this was covered, and I'll just go over it quickly, but the IgE-mediated, like food allergens, penetrate mucosal barriers and reach specific IgE antibodies bound to mast cells, such as histamine, all right? And then leukotri leukotrienes are released through inducing an immediate hypersensitivity reaction, leading to specific symptoms, allergic or, yeah, what well, would be an allergic reaction, okay, such as wheezing associated with asthma or urticaria or angioedema, okay? This is just a list of some common food allergies. Um, the most common food allergies is cow's milk. It affects approximately 2.5% of children uh, during the first two years of life. Remember, this is really focused on pediatrics. Uh, right, egg is the second most common food allergy, followed by peanuts. Even though peanuts gets a lot of publicity today, um, it's, it's cow's milk that re is really the primary one. Then there's tree nuts, and I just gave examples, say walnuts, peanuts, almonds, um, soy, wheat, and seafood. Um, this goes into a little bit more detail as far as the diagnosis, how do you make the diagnosis, whether it's a food allergy or it's a food intolerance. So if you've got a child and you're taking them to the pediatrician or to the nurse practitioner or whatever, the first thing that they're going to ask you is that they're going to go over all of this, but the first thing would be to start with the history and the physical exam. Um, and the medical history is really important. I mean, it's going to focus on foods that the parent may feel would be, in, you know, would induce an allergic reaction. Um, type of allergic reaction? Do they think that the child ate something and then had an unusual reaction or an allergic reaction? And what was that reaction? Was it something, did the child vomit? Did they have diarrhea? Um, would, did they develop any kind of like an anaphylaxis or a rash secondary to eating something is what you want to start with. And then also what's important is a family history because there's a, there's a strong connection if there's a family history of allergies or allergic reactions. So if you're asking the child has an allergic reaction, it would be important to check whether a parent has an allergic reaction to a specific food or other children in the family, do they have an allergic reaction? That's really an important component. Um, I'm sort of moving along, I wanna get everything here. Um, and then the next thing is actually doing the physical exam. And what are you looking for specifically in a child that you're concerned about, say, has an allergic reaction? Um, signs that may be consistent with, say, with an allergy or with allergic reaction would be atopy. Atopy, is, if you're not familiar, it's just another word for like urticaria or an allergic reaction. It could be eczema. It could be some kind of a rash. Um, and oftentimes what you're looking for, certainly in an infant or a young child, would be a rash on the face. 
um, like an eczema or scaling or dry, rough skin on the cheeks in particular. As the child gets a little older, the areas that you would focus on would be, say, the flexor surfaces, which means the flexor surface of the elbow or behind the knees. It could be in the neck, neck folds. I mean, it could be in the folds, in the ankles. But you generally see that, say, in a, maybe in a little bit of an older child than you would then in an in a, um, infant. But those are the uh, things that you would be examining and specifically looking for on a physical exam. So the skin exam is important. Um, in addition to that, um, you're certainly going to do a lung exam to assess if there's any wheezing and certainly ask a parent if there's any kind of wheezing or respiratory difficulty in conjunction with, with say, ingesting certain foods. That's a really important question because that can possibly lead them to anaphylaxis. Um, and the skin prick test, and this was mentioned just, pre just, just before, but I'll go over it a little bit more. The uh, scratch test or the skin prick test is recommended as the primary method for the diagnosis of IgE-mediated allergies. So if this child has an allergy or and you don't know whether it's an allergy or a food intolerance, to make that differentiation, you would do a skin prick test, okay? And what, I'm just briefly here, small amounts of the allergen are introduced into the epidermis and interact with specific IgE mast cells. Um, and in a positive response, the histamine is released, leading to a visible wheel or flare, all right? And reaction peaking in approximately 15 minutes or longer. Um, also, another form of testing that can be done is in vitro testing. An FEIA or fluorescent immune assay is what is done today. You may be familiar with this, called, something called a RAS test, which used to be, which, which used to be done for, um, for blood screening or for the serum, um, and that's been replaced by, this, by the fluorescent enzyme assay. And what it does is it measures food-specific IgE in the serum. So it's, it's different. It's the, so the first test would be the skin prick test, and then there would be the FEIA. And I just put down here the radioallergy absorbent test, with, and it's been replaced. This is the newer one, newer version of it, basically. Um, and then the next thing that you're going to do when you do have a child that you're worried about that has either a food allergy um, or a food intolerance and you're not sure would be an elimination diet. Sometimes this is really difficult because you don't know sometimes say peanuts as an example can be a lot of can be in things that you're not aware of so it's like important as sort of if you're working with a family to make sure that they understand to read the the ingredients in in products so they know what it's you know what's in it um, sometimes it says you you know if there's a peanut allergy not to use a specific food even though the food doesn't contain peanuts it may be processed in a plant where there were peanuts and if a child has a really severe allergic reaction or concerns about peanuts that would be something to be aware of um, but when you're doing an elimination diet um, you're going to remove one or several suspect foods from a patient's diet to determine if they're causing or exacerbating the, the condition and so if you don't really know, you need to start with one, one food that you think is suspect. I mean, you can't obviously take everything out of the diet, but you have to do it gradually um, and really know that you've taken that out of the diet, whether if it's milk or say if it's a soy product. You have to do one thing at a time, one product at a time, and really read the ingredients when you're giving the child whatever it is, you know, breakfast, lunch, whatever kind of foods, so that you know that it's not in that, that, it's not in that food. Okay, um, and if improvement is noted, then, allergy, then the allergy is possible and further objective testing would be necessary to implicate that the food uh, should be further pursued. Okay, so if you take a food out and you see that there's a difference, um, that's sort of the beginning step. So you would need maybe further testing to confirm that. Um, if there's no improvement uh, is noted with the appropriate period of avoidance, um, then, then allergy to that food is unlikely. It just, it takes a long time if you have no idea. Maybe if it's, if it's a fruit that you're worried about and maybe the child develops some kind of angioedema or some swelling or some tingling in their mouth and you're not really sure, um, it's, it's really wise to sort of eliminate certain, certain fruits for like a, for a period of time. And the recommendation is for up to two weeks. Okay, so whether you maybe think it's grapes or you think it's strawberries. Take that out of the diet and see what happens if, there's a, if the child develops any of those reactions. Um, where was I? Oh, so the trial elimination diet should be limited in duration. A period of approximately two weeks is usually what's recommended to see a response in an IgE-mediated disorders. Okay. Um, 
even though I've gone over all these sort of the different steps, sometimes it's difficult to do eliminate an elimination diet when you don't know what you're dealing with. So it, it sort of takes some time and organization to figure out what foods you think may be contributors. The next thing to do would be an oral food challenge. Um, and that's determining if an allergy has resolved. An oral food challenge is the gold standard for the evaluation of food allergies. All right, and it's done, it consists of gradually feeding the, uh, uh, you know, the food that you're concerned about, giving it to the child, but it's done under close observation in the, you know, in the doctor's office. You wouldn't do this at home. You would bring the child into the pediatrician and under a controlled environment do this. Particularly like if you're worried about peanuts, which is such a big deal today. It's a very, it's a big deal because it's really a problem in the schools. In some schools there's peanut free tables, um, when children bring in snacks or bring in something for the whole class, it can't be anything that contains peanuts. Um, so it, it causes a big, a, it's a big issue. Um, so it's really important if you have a concern and maybe you think the child is slowly outgrowing this peanut allergy, you don't want to test them at home and sort of, let's try some peanut butter and see what happens. <laughs> you clearly don't want to do that. So you would make an appointment, bring them into the pediatrician's office and do it under a controlled environment in case there is still a response. So the oral food challenge really serves basically there's, there's two roles in managing the food allergies. Confirms the diagnosis of a specific food allergy and also determines if an identified allergy persists or has resolved. Oops, let me just see where I am here. Okay. So the food, just the age for testing, because people always ask, how soon can you have a child tested? Do you have to wait till they're, say, two or three? Um, no. So food allergy most often begins in the first two years of life. Um, and obviously the first one that you are aware of, that people are always aware of, is the, is the milk allergy. Uh, the skin prick test in infants less than 12 months of age may not yet fully reflect their allergic sensitivities. And it may not reflect it if they haven't been exposed to that particular food. I mean, usually a child, say, under less than 12 months is not going to have had peanuts, as an example. Um, so it's hard to know that, where a child that age will have had have exposure to milk. Um, in contrast, the food-specific Ig is valid for infants as young as six weeks of age. So you can start this very early and can be performed also on capillary blood samples. Um, but I just put down there in quotes that children shouldn't be tested for food allergies prior to introduction into their diet. So if they haven't had the food, you're not gonna test for it. I mean, that just makes sense. Unless you think that they may have had it and you're not aware of it. You know, when kids are in school and daycare or possibly even in the early elementary grades, and they, they may not be sure of, you know, that they have a food allergy and they're eating something that somebody brought in or they're switching somebody's lunch with somebody else's lunch, you don't know. And so then they could have a reaction. Sometimes you're not always sure what it was or what caused it. Oh, did I skip something here? Yeah, um, just another comment here, skin and respiratory manifestations. There is, and this was mentioned, there's a strong association between, say, atopic dermatitis, okay, and food allergies, and that I've just mentioned. So, an atopic dermatitis, remember, is just sort of another term also, like asthma, all right, where you get red, raised, itchy area, five minutes, I'm gonna move right along, okay. Um, off, but. Uh, like an atopic dermatitis would be like, say, asthma. All right. I mean, would be like, say, um, eczema, I'm sorry. Um, so also, and children with food allergies are more likely to report eczema, urticaria, or angioedema. And the factor most commonly identified with severe food allergies is the coexistence of asthma. So that's an important consideration, because many times children that do have food allergies also have, have certain foods can trigger an asthma exacerbation or, or bring on wheezing. All right, so that's an important consideration. These are just some examples. That first one up on the left with the, the child with the puffy lips is an example of angioedema, which is swelling that can occur, say, after the child ate strawberries, as an example. It's a perfect example. Some kids are allergic to strawberries, and they just get the, when, the, when they get it into their mouth, this is what can occur. The example on the right there, the cheeks of that child is an example of eczema, and that's usually a milk allergy that you see early on in the, in the, in the, during the infant period. This is uh, an example, this slide here in particular, you can see some eczema also um, in the flexor surface of the feet. 
Okay, and then the other one is another picture of, of a skin, like an eczema, an allergic reaction. Okay. Um, and so just quickly, management principles. Once food allergy has been diagnosed, the mainstay of therapy is strict removal of all foods that, call that, uh, that cause that allergic reaction. All right. And so this kind of information needs to go to school with the child so that the school nurse knows that a certain child has a certain kind of an allergy, whether it's uh, seafood or it's soy or whatever it is. And they need to know what the reaction the child has when they, have, when they ingest that food. Okay, do they just have a rash? Do they have a tingling in their mouth? Do they have anaphylaxis? Um, and so obviously to remove those foods, but in school sometimes that doesn't always happen. And today the school nurses are very familiar with using the EpiPens because so many children that have allergies have an EpiPen and it's, and it's located in the school nurse's office. And they have a full report of what's going on. I mean, what the child's allergy is, how they react, Okay, and then if the child, and this, these, time, these reactions many times happen during the lunch time in the cafeteria if the child has an immediate reaction. And this is just real brief, first line treatment is epinephrine, that's your EpiPen, okay. Um, and then adjunctive therapy would be like say Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, and then the bronchodilator beta-2 agonist. Okay, hey, that was fast. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. So, so um, we'll be leaving the IgE mediated um, topics for a minute, although I guess there's some allergy. And the next speaker is Dr. Alan Leitner. He is um, Associate Chief, the Division of Gastroenterology and Nutrition at Boston Children's Hospital and Associate Director of the Master's Program in Health Professions Education at Massachusetts General Hospital, one of his newer um, jobs that he's taken on. I don't want to take your time. So you yeah. Thanks, uh, Nancy and the other people who invited me. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Katie, who's in the office, uh, or who's in the audience, and was one of the people who helped us start our celiac disease center at Children's Hospital. The, the first slide that you see uh, demonstrates that celiac disease has really become a family issue. So all age groups are involved, can be involved with uh, celiac disease. It's diagnosed at all ages. And furthermore, it takes a family really to help manage celiac disease. Everybody in the family has to be aware. So let's just take a straw poll here. How many people in the audience have celiac disease? One, two, Three. How about how many people have a family member with celiac disease? One, two. Gluten. In, we're going to talk about gluten intolerance. Uh, how about a friend or acquaintance, someone you eat with that has celiac disease? So that's a bigger percentage. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some definitions about celiac disease and gluten. We're going to give you some over, overview and a little bit of background. I couldn't help but put a couple historical slides in there. We'll talk to you about how the patient presents with celiac disease, what symptoms and what complications can they get, uh, how we make the diagnosis now in 2013, uh, what's the treatment, and we'll touch on other causes of gluten intolerance, which are becoming increasingly important. Uh, I'll also warn you that I, the good news is I cut down the number of slides I usually have for this talk, which is 80, uh, but they're still a little bit north of 30. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly, and I'm, I, I might steal a little time from the question and answer period. So celiac disease, it's an autoimmune disease. The immune system turns against the body that affects the small intestine, and it's caused by permanent sensitivity to three grains, wheat, rye, and barley. And it happens in people who are genetically susceptible to this. And gluten is the term for the group of proteins in wheat, and it's actually been extended to the other grains as well, rye and barley, that give it the unique properties that we, we want for baking, but also make it toxic to people with celiac disease. And so why those three grains? Well, 
This is the family constellation of um, the grains, the grasses, and you can see that wheat, rye, and barley are all very closely related grasses. Oats is a step apart. We'll talk about oats, which are probably okay for people with celiac disease. And these other things, wild rice, rice, finger millet, teff, are safe for people with celiac disease. But that's why those three grains. Um, there has been a tremendous revolution. I'm an old gastroenterologist, but there's been a tremendous revolution during my lifetime of ce about celiac disease, okay? So we started before 1980, not so long ago, um, where celiac disease was thought to be rare, occurred primarily in Caucasian kids. It had, was thought to only cause gastrointestinal symptoms. And the age of the diagnosis was typically under three. And this is a typical child who presented with celiac disease. After 1980, we learned that that's not all of celiac disease. So now we know it's a common disease. And in fact, if there are two pe 200 people in the audience, having two or three with celiac disease is what we would expect. It affects many different populations, not just Western Europeans. Uh, it causes a large range of gastrointestinal and extra intestinal symptoms and that the average age of diagnosis in children is now nine years. So the nine-year-old, um, and people don't present as sick. So a healthy appearing nine-year-old is what you would expect. In adults, the average age of diagnosis of celiac disease is 40. Um, so it gives you a little bit of a sense. And why did that happen? Well, it happened because a new screening test for celiac disease was discovered. Right around 1980, this is the anti-gliadin antibody, gliadin being one of the toxic components of wheat. And then there were a series of tests, uh, the endomesial antibody, the tissue transglutaminase antibody. We're gonna just call it the TTG. This is the one I want you to remember. And there are even some newer tests that have just come out. But it's the TTG that's best. So it's 94% sensitive. That means out of 100 patients with celiac disease, you're going to pick up 94. That's pretty much as good as a test gets. And it's 97% specific. So it's rare that somebody who doesn't have celiac disease has a positive test. So it's a really, really good lab test. This is what I saw when I was in training, which is a little child with a very distended abdomen, not much fat. If you look at the little rear end, is, uh, is not too rounded there. Irritable because having cramps in the belly and can't, and long eyelashes, which you can't see, are actually a sign of malnutrition in kids, even though the mothers love the eyelashes. <laughs> And so onset between 6 and 24 months, chronic diarrhea, fat distended abdomen, poor appetite, failure to thrive or actual weight loss in little ones, abdominal pain, vomiting, and that irritability. And lest you think it was a, a unusual thing, this is a picture from 1939 orphanage and a whole slew of children with um, celiac disease. And this is a, a very important thing that happened. So during World War II, the grain supplies that fed the kid in, kids in the orphanage were interrupted. As a result of that, they were given alternative diets. Bananas, they were given mussels, mussels from the sea. And lo and behold, all those little kids that you saw got better and dick up who as a pediatrician was the one who discovered this. And so it was only in 1955 that we learned that celiac disease was due to wheat. Um, and using that new antibody test, we have been able to screen the population. And this is a study, I'm not gonna take you through every detail of this study, but 4,000 healthy individuals were screened with the blood test. Out of those 4,000 healthy individuals, 
Um, we found that 31 had celiac disease, so one out of every 133 patients had celiac disease. If you look at high-risk groups, high-risk groups are patients with GI symptoms. One in 40 uh, had celiac disease. First-degree relatives of patients with celiac disease, one out of every 20 to 5%. Okay, so that woke up our eyes and says that, you know, this is really a very common percent uh, a disease. It's 1% of the population. Um, so worldwide now, it's 0.6 to 1%. If you come from Finland, it's 2.5%. It's developing countries uh, as well as uh, developed countries. So a big hotbed right now is northern India. Uh, which was thought not to be a place where celiac or disease occurred. For some reason we don't know, it's more common in females than in males. And there are a number of risk factors. So if you're a first degree relative, you have a 10 to 15% chance of developing celiac disease. If you have autoimmune disease, diabetes, thyroid disease, or others, you have a higher chance of developing celiac disease. If you have certain genetic disorders, in Down syndrome, for instance, there's an increased risk of celiac disease. And IgA deficiency, IgA is a type of antibody. And the reason that it's important to mention this is that the usual TTG antibody we use is of the IgA class. And if you have IgA deficiency, you won't be able to diagnose celiac disease using that test. And so here is what we think of as the mantra for celiac disease. It's the iceberg, right? Most people with celiac disease do not know that they have celiac disease. And they're undiagnosed. So uh, it's estimated there are two million people in the United States that have celiac disease. Of those two million, 300,000 are diagnosed. So about, that's not very much, less than 20% of, of the population. And here's the scheme. I'm losing my uh, pointer, but at above the water level are the people who have symptoms with their celiac disease. Okay, either, yeah, either GI symptoms at the very top or any symptoms. And then there's a group who still have the damage to their intestine but are below the water level and have silent celiac disease. That's most people. And beyond that are people who are in the process of developing celiac disease. They don't even have the damage to their intestine yet. And those are the people who have latent celiac disease. They have a positive blood test, but they haven't dam gotten the damage to their intestine yet. We're in the middle of an epidemic of celiac disease. So these are the number of kids we diagnose per year at Children's Hospital with celiac disease. So it is, in 2003, it was less than 40. And now uh, we're averaging 150 kids a year. I just talked to the head of the adult celiac center at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. They, they diagnose 120 adults a year. So that's quite a few people for a disease that was judged to be rare. What are the symptoms? So I want to tell you about the symptoms. This is our group of patients at Children's. So abdominal pain and cramps in about half of them. Bellies are distended in 13%. About 30% of di patients have diarrhea. But this is interesting. Both in adults and kids, chronic constipation can be a symptom of celiac disease. Nausea, well, I'm going to go through nausea, vomiting, decreased appetite, weight loss, or poor growth. And 14% of our patients had no symptoms. Those were high-risk patients that we identified because they were at risk and screened, and lo and behold, they had celiac disease. But what you must be aware of is the atypical manifestations of celiac disease in adults are more common than those GI symptoms. So fatigue, iron deficiency, low bone density, Kids can be born with little pits in their teeth, enamel deficiency. I mentioned short stature and delayed puberty in adolescence, behavioral problems that correlates with the irritability of the babies, 
dermatitis herpetiformis is a skin manifestation of celiac disease. Elevation of your liver tests. One of the most common causes is celiac disease. Joint pain or arthritis, infertility. So infertility clinics, five to 10% of people have celiac disease. Migraine headaches, seizures, and recurrent oral ulcers. So you have to be aware of these atypical manifestations. It's interesting that celiac disease is a disease where it's both nature and nurture, okay? So nature is the genetics. We know that you have to have certain HLA genes to have celiac disease. HLA genes are genes that people use for transplant. They code for certain proteins on the surface of your cells. So you have to have a specific type of protein on the surface of your cells to get celiac disease. But other genes are involved as in well, and we're just in the process of identifying them. And there are environmental factors. The obvious one is gluten. You take gluten out of the diet, and everything heals. But what triggers celiac disease? Why do some people get it at age 70, and some people get it at age 2? So maybe there's an environmental trigger. So in terms of the genetics, you must have the right HLA genes, OK? The problem with the, and they're called DQ2 and DQ8. But the problem with it is that 30% of the population, 30% of this audience has DQ2 and DQ8. So it's not a way to find out whether you have celiac disease. It's a way to find out that you don't have celiac disease because you must have these genes. If the test is negative, you can't develop celiac disease. But there are 39 other genes that have been associated with celiac disease. So you need the right HLA genes plus these other genes to develop celiac disease. The environmental factors, the obvious one is gluten. But as a pediatrician, I'm very interested in early childhood events. So infections, rotavirus, which used to be the norovirus of yesteryear, but there's a vaccine for rotavirus. But GI bugs, gastrointestinal viruses, have been shown to uh, precipitate, increase the risk of celiac disease. Season of birth. So if you're born in the spring or the summer, and when you get gluten, you're getting into the fall or the winter when all the infections are, you have an increased risk of getting celiac disease. We know that most studies show that breastfeeding is protective. So if you, you want to introduce gluten into the baby's diet when you're breastfeeding, and um, if you start gluten too early and in large amounts, that increases your risk of developing celiac disease. Or it makes it so you develop your celiac disease sooner because you're loading somebody with the gluten. Um, I may not go through this in detail, but bear with me on this scheme, okay? You eat gluten, okay? Somehow, the gluten gets across the border of your intestine, and tissue transglutaminase, which is an enzyme there, uh, changes it so it binds to this HLA protein on the surface of the cell that then triggers the immune system. Okay, and once the immune system is triggered, it recruits things that damage the cell lining. So the nice, long, thin cells get reduced to shorter, stubby cells that don't work well. So that's how you get the damage to your intestine. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, who should we test? We should test nowadays the the patient with typical or that list of atypical symptoms. If you have recurrent oral ulcers, mouth sores, you ought to be tested for celiac disease. Um, or GI symptoms, or somebody, I believe, who's a family member of, of, of a patient with celiac disease. What blood test? The IgA TTG is the best blood test. But you should also make sure they're not IgA deficient by doing a serum IgA test. What to do if there are I, IgA deficient? Well, you can do an IgG test uh, for TTG or the DGP. 
And what is the definitive test? The definitive test is still a biopsy of the intestine. I was thrilled. Uh, I got five minutes. Okay. I'll take six. Okay. So here's endoscopy. So what happens in celiac disease is the finger-like projections that increase the surface area of your intestine get flattened with celiac disease. These are standard endoscopic pictures, and you can't see the villi. But what people have noticed is that you get the scalloped appearance, or you lose these folds, and it looks like a mosaic pattern. OK, that's the old days. Here's my favorite picture. This is new high-resolution endoscopy, and you can see the villi. And you also don't see them in somebody with celiac disease, just to show you how the technology is getting better. And under the microscope, this is what you see. These are the villi in cross-section, normal. Here in stage one, there are just too many inflammatory cells here, but they still have villi. In stage two, the crypt cells down here that make new villi get larger because the turnover is more. And then classically, you lose the villi. So this is partial, at partial atrophy, subtotal atrophy, or total atrophy. Um, what's new? Well, in kids now, there are new guidelines from Europe that say maybe you don't need to do a biopsy in kids who have very high titers of the antibody levels as long as they have symptoms and you demonstrate that their symptoms go away on a gluten-free diet. And what are the diagnostic errors that clinicians make? They make the diagnosis based on the worst blood test, the IgG anti-gliadin antibody, for which I don't think there is a role here. So not all antibodies are definitive of making this diagnosis. Or they start the gluten-free diet before the diagnosis is confirmed, and then you never know. I'm on to treatment, which is the end part of the talk, OK? So gluten-free diet, gluten's very toxic, 50 milligrams. What's 50 milligrams? Is the one-tenth the weight of a standard paper clip is all that it takes a day to cause celiac disease. The diet is difficult. It requires education of the family. It's expensive. It restricts wheat, rye, and barley. And oats probably are good, but you must get gluten-free oats, OK, that are not contaminated. And it's a diet for life. Now, I'm not going through this list, but this is just to show you all the kinds of food additives that might contain gluten. Um, the good news is that wheat is now listed on labels, but barley and rye are not. What do we recommend? We recommend that children have a gluten-free multivitamin, that they meet their uh, requirements for calcium and vitamin D. We suggest alternate grains to boost fiber, B vitamin, protein, and iron intake, and encourage uh, the intake of iron and fiber-rich gluten-free foods. The problem is that wheat flour in this country is, is fortified with B vitamins and iron. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't eat that, you don't get that fortification. So we're, we play it safe. Uh, this is Gwyneth Paltrow. This is to show you. So I told you there are 300,000 people who know they have celiac disease in the United States. How many people are on a gluten-free diet in the United States? Two million. And why? Because they have other kinds of gluten intolerance, or they do it as a fad diet. Now, the part of me that's a strict physician doesn't like that. Uh, but the part of me that says, well, these people are increasing the availability of gluten-free food says it's a great thing. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you that adherence. Uh, the caption is, I'd like you to stay home tonight. The weather report says there's a large area of peer pressure blowing in from the east. It's difficult, especially in kids and adults. The younger kids who are supervised by the parents do OK. The challenges for the diet is there's no standard for gluten-free. The FDA is about to rule on this, hopefully, so that we'll see on foods a gluten-free label. You can just look for the GF. 
Uh, as of 2006, the major allergens we heard about are listed on labels. There's also the issue of cross-contamination and there are hidden sources of gluten. Some of these are now gone, but think about this Play-Doh for kids. There are now gluten-free Play-Dohs. Mouthwashes and toothpaste now are gluten-free, but didn't used to be. Um, stamp and envelope glue, glues, we stopped licking stamps and envelopes, right? One of the reason is because they contain um, gluten. And we've talked about oats. The major complications are nutritional. You don't absorb calcium, iron, folate, and other vitamins as well. Interestingly, you can have a decreased response to hepatitis B vaccine if you have celiac disease. Other autoimmune diseases are more common. Very rarely, there are certain kinds of cancer that are more common in celiac disease. But the good news is that if you're on a gluten-free diet, these risks go away. And there are very few people uh, who don't respond to the diet. I'm on recommended follow-up, and then I'm just going to leave you with the holy grail. So we see kids at one to three months post-diagnosis to make sure they're doing okay on the diet, repeat the, the blood test. The blood test comes down to normal. It's a good way to follow people on the diet. And then see them yearly, and I recommend screening first-degree relatives. Here's the holy grail. What does everybody with celiac disease want? They want a treatment that will, they'll be able to take a pill and they can eat a regular diet. That's what people with celiac disease want. And there are lots of ways to get that under development. I'm not going to go through all these little things, but I'm going to tell you, people are doing genetic engineering to find, get wheat that doesn't have gluten. Unfortunately, it's lousy for baking, but they're doing that. Um, they're looking to get a pill that you can take when you start eating gluten that will help digest it or bind it. And then there are all sorts of immune things that they're using to block the reaction. Um, my second to last slide, just to, okay. <laughs> What's it been, 45 minutes? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's okay, okay. All right, so here's the reasons for gluten intolerance. Celiac disease is one of them. Wheat allergy that we heard about is common in kids, less common in adults. And the emerging problem is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So this is a disease where you typically don't have damage to the lining of the intestine, but you get the same kind of symptoms as you do with um, uh, celiac disease. And it's thought maybe it's related to irritable bowel syndrome, but it's extraordinarily uh, common now, and we're seeing more and more cases in all age groups. So take home points. Celiac disease increasingly diagnosed in all age groups, and there's actually evidence that the, the incidence is increasing over time. It's not just that we're more aware of this, but this is becoming a more common disease. It has both genetic and environmental factors that might help us lead to that holy grail of a non-dietary therapy. Older and children and adults are more likely to have these atypical symptoms. Think about them. Uh, diagnosis is based on clinical suspicion. You have to think about this first. Screening with a serological test, and still in 2013, in most cases, biopsies, although we're, there are certain categories of kids that we're no longer doing them on. The diet remains challenging, and we're waiting for the FDA to uh, rule soon on the gluten-free diet. As of yet, there's no practical and safe alternative to the diet, but I expect that we'll see one soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leitner. So the next speaker is Janice Hope Arnold, and she's a clinical social worker within the Celiac Clinic at Pediatric um, GI Clinic. Um, I'd like to thank Regis College for inviting me and feeling that it was um, worthwhile to highlight the psychosocial spoke on this wheel, so to speak. Um, 
what I'm going to be covering is really going to take a pretty broad lens at a lot of these considerations in terms of managing celiac. Um, and, and the perspective is probably going to focus much more on pediatrics, uh, and that's the family system. So an overview, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about adjustment and coping. The impact on family members, I want to echo what Dr. Leitner said, a, a, a childhood illness and medical condition really is a family medical condition. The developmental considerations in terms of working with the patient and the family members, uh, the, the role that temperament can play and how we would approach adherence and adjustment, and explaining celiac disease as a family to other folks in, in a family's life. In the interest of time, there are some slides in here that I wanted to include in the handouts, but I'm, I'm going to choose to not focus on. I'll, I'll skip over a couple of those. When we look at the general adjustment to celiac, what we're dealing with is really a disconcordance with many developmental tasks, depending on when the diagnosis is made and what the trajectory uh, and acceleration of the symptoms have been in terms of how much of an interference it plays uh, with, a, with a child or a family's lifestyle. It can insist on dependence depending on the age of diagnosis, and this can affect the ability to have autonomy. There is a potential antisocial nature of symptoms which can lead to social desirability being affected, referencing the diarrhea, constipation, bloating, things that can make patients and family members feel like it's not safe to be in, in large social surroundings. There can be an impact on standard milestones. There can be isolation, and often in my experience, it's a self-initiated isolation. Uh, patients and, and kids who just don't want to go out if they know they're going to not be able to eat. What friends around them are eating, not being able to go out to large family dinners um, or social gatherings that are going to occur at a place where there's not going to be safe gluten-free foods. Most importantly, when we're looking at adjustment to celiac, at the end of the day, we see a tremendous adaptability and resiliency, and that's the goal of looking at all of these psychosocial considerations so that we're really promoting that. Coping with celiac, we have to look at the different coping styles across the family system. And, that, and recognize that there is, in fact, different developmental stages of everyone living in that household or even in a, a two-household family. There's the previous context with what other illnesses have affected that family. And there's often the ambivalence between craving choices when you're given a diagnosis that at the same time can take a lot of control away and that desperation of craving guidance. For a lot of the parents, what we see is a loss of the anticipated childhood in that there's a, a lack of spontaneity that can still be a part of the day, and there can need to be an inordinate amount of vigilance. And we recognize that coping can often mirror the grief cycle. We see this with the patients, we see this with the parents, um, where you know there's anger and resentment at first about needing to eliminate gluten. There's a lot of bargaining that happens. What if I do the best I can? What if during the school week I go gluten-free? On the weekends, can I not go gluten-free? We have to look at the overall framework, um, and it's different when you're dealing with a chronic condition because it's just ongoing management. And so, as we know, for, for someone in a family managing celiac, the vigilance never goes away, and that's exhausting uh, and expensive. It's, it can be cyclical depending on the exposures. There's no cure, and the goals change, the objectives of treatment change. We really want to control the progression, we want to relieve the discomfort, and we're managing symptoms, and that's, it's hard when when families sometimes know that even if you do the best you can, you're not ever going to escape what needs to be the constant vigilance. Illness variables, onset, how fast did this come about, how visible was it? Um, was it perhaps an incidental finding? And we see that a lot in our clinic. Patients who are tested because their sibling has celiac. Patients who are tested because they also have type 1 diabetes. And so you can imagine that if you are given this diagnosis and you've never had a symptom, it can be much harder to feel compelled to want to adhere. The typography, what I consider typography of an illness, where we're looking at um, the trajectory. With celiac, thankfully, the learning curve, it, it's pretty steep, but it plateaus. Once you adjust and learn the information, there's not lots of new information to constantly learn. The visibility and function, how visible the symptoms have been and how it affects a family's functioning, ability to interact in the social spheres. The social consequences. Um, I'm just going to go through this one really quickly. With any chronic illness, but certainly with, with celiac, we see some shattered assumptions, assumptions of ease, assumptions of, um, of spontaneity, assumptions of a child being able to increase independence without needing to do a tremendous amount of, of label reading, which gives parents a little bit uh, less comfort level with, with letting some kids um, be a little bit more independent. There's vulnerability. There's uncertainty and unpredictability, not knowing how this might progress. And we see certain vertexes of stress with celiac, and this can occur at many 
various points in the, in the experience, certainly at the time of new diagnosis, the time that a family actually initiates the diet or the patient initiates the diet, which is sometimes not right at diagnosis, when there's been an exposure, which can often feel like a setback, when there is eventual school or work reentry, if there's been a period of sickness and illness. If there's a new developmental stage, we see this all the time, you have, you have a patient or a, a child who's had celiac for years and they did beautifully in terms of adherence when they were toddlers or school age and suddenly they're adolescents. And none of the facts of the diagnosis have changed, but their developmental stage has changed. And any decision making, so that could be in the moment of whether or not you're going to choose to allow an exposure um, or it could be something as detailed as you know what type of family vacation you're going to take because you have to look at you know what amusement parks are going to have gluten-free friendly options. I did want to just introduce and touch on the biopsychosocial model when we're looking at celiac and so this is really the confluence of three main spheres and this is how um, we would want to, to inform what we're going to try to promote in the patients and the families who are managing this. There's the psychological sphere, and this encompasses the psychological and emotional functioning of a, of a family, of a child, the temperament that's involved, the motivational level uh, for adherence, and the problem-solving ability. You can marry that with the social sphere, which, which would highlight the family functioning and adjustment in day-to-day -day settings, the social functioning, which would include school and work and peers, daily hassles, every family has them, any major life event that has peppered the family's life, which could inform how a family has coped with that, and the level of social supports. And then you bring in the biological sphere, which is really where the celiac becomes relevant, how much it affects physical functioning, which would depend on the symptoms that preceded the diagnosis, what the diagnosis itself is, the severity of the diagnosis. Is, this, is, is someone who, when they're exposed to gluten, doesn't have any symptoms, so it doesn't feel like it's that visible, or is it someone who will know immediately once they have an exposure due to physical symptoms? So these all come together, and what we're trying to do is reconcile these spheres so that we're promoting maximum adaptation and quality of life, and ultimately their well-being. I'm gonna skip over this. These are, this is a study that looked at some of the fears that are present amidst medical diagnosis, and it's just helpful to remember that as we're working with families in, in terms of the um, layers that they're kind of managing. Um, when we're dealing with celiac, we're looking at patients and really everyone in the family system. I want to start with the patient. The impact on the patient is really managing their daily life. They're the ones charged with needing to make those moment-to-moment -moment decisions, needing to still attain their milestones, needing to not self-inhibit in terms of social opportunities. And we do see a tremendous amount of anxiety and fear, and sometimes that's built into the word disease, um, which can be very overwhelming, especially for the younger children. We know that children will read our facial cues and our tones of voice in terms of how worried to be. We also know that children have this uncanny ability to want to protect their parents, so sometimes that will impact what they're willing to share. And we want to make sure that we're always answering the questions honestly. Um, we want to dispel myths early on, and I see that you know, more often than not, children will make up their own story if they don't have the facts, and the story that they make up is usually much worse than the real story. We want to try to protect them from any sort of projection of the adult's responses to the diagnosis um, and make sure that they're not trying to answer questions in an attempt to please us or, or the clinicians. Um, and then we have the adherence to the diet that Dr. Leitner touched upon. If they don't have the right information, we can't expect them to be compliant because there's no way that it can't impact their cost-benefit analysis. And every decision we make really on a daily basis children or adults is cost benefit. And so when we're charging a teenager or a, a younger school age child with needing to make the safest and healthiest decision, we have to make sure that we're making it so that the cost is worth the benefit. And that can't be expected if we are not explaining the rationale. We need to be mindful of developmental stages and the way those impact instant gratification. And we have to remember that there's a very subjective opinion of symptoms. I have many patients who will say to me that, um, they're willing to deal with the diarrhea, they're willing to deal with the constipation, so if they're willing to deal with it, why does it matter? Um, and that's subjective. To them, it's, it's better than having to adhere to the diet. And there's a loss of control. Um, this says, your father and I want you to know that you can talk to us about anything, especially where you've hidden your sister. We see a, a, a large um, impact and trickle-down effect on siblings if there are siblings in the household. Um, and sometimes the trickle-down effect can be enormous resiliency and, and teamwork. Uh, sometimes it can be confusion and resentment. The range, of, the range of responses can be as varied as the siblings themselves, but certainly we want to be mindful of the fact that there could be anger, anger at disruption to the family's lifestyle. 
There could be fear. You know, children aren't supposed to get diseases, so if, if my sister got a disease, does that make me vulnerable too? There can be jealousy over division of resources and attention in the family, guilt uh, for the younger si siblings who have magical thinking that they, you know, because they said something mean about their sister, they gave their sister celiac, embarrassment if it in fact impacts social functioning and the ability to go to certain restaurants or not be part of events, and confusion. How does this happen? How does my sibling look well and is not well? Impact on parents and caregivers. We know that parents can often experience what a child can't experience, and so often with parents we see the greatest sense of grief um, and loss, more so than the, than the patient themselves. They are the ones who often feel hopeless, feel afraid of the inability to ever learn the, the ins and outs of the diet. Over time, we know that it's easy to kind of relocate these feelings onto the other family member, and this is because we all want validation. We all kind of Kushner reference this emotional companionship, and it's really the adults in the household who are often searching for that emotional companionship and deserve it. We see some resistance, certainly. Um, there's just denial. You know, I've never had a symptom. This can't be. It's got to be a, a false positive. Um, we don't want to join this club. We didn't ask to be part of this. Um, there's also certainly a lack of experience to navigate a very complex healthcare system and label reading, which is not easy, um, even for very high health literacy levels. There can be a lack of motivation, and sometimes that really just reflects the avoidance of another stage. We have a lot of patients who take a long time to maybe get to the endoscopy, and it's because until they have that endoscopy, they don't have celiac disease. Um, and so it's not an ability to sabotage, it's just an ability to protect their, their kind of pre-diagnosis life. There are some occasional secondary gains. We don't see this a lot, but there are certainly some patients where we have to, you know, there, I had a patient actually a couple months ago who didn't mind the symptoms so much from being exposed, but as soon as she was exposed and had some symptoms, she didn't have to do any household chores. And that was a better deal for her. <laughs> it just worked out better for her. Um, and so, you know, things like that can sometimes creep in, again, depending on the cost benefit. Um, so as we talked about, this really affects an entire family. This is a, a family meeting about to occur. And we do a lot of family meetings at, in the clinic uh, because we really need to make sure that we're promoting the resiliency and the adaptation of everyone in a household or in a family system. The impact on a family can be helplessness, powerlessness, anger. There's certainly a tremendous amount of financial stress. The diet is the, is the treatment, and it doesn't ever go away. You don't just pay a copay for two weeks of penicillin. You are on this diet and buying these products for life. There's changes in role functioning. Um, there's certainly a, a tremendous amount of marital stress if there has been a change in role functioning or if there's different coping styles. There can be the mourning of the present and future losses, and those are usually around spontaneity and convenience. And we have just different coping styles with, with any family member. I'm not going to go through this at length. I did just want to make sure that we highlight what the developmental framework is because it affects how certain variables at the time of diagnosis, the visibility of the symptoms, and the adherence to the diet can impact the tasks affiliated with each stage. So here on the left, um, we have the different stages and the tasks that ideally we're looking to master at those stages. If you have constant medical interventions or constant symptoms or constant disruption to milestones, there can be an impact on the tasks that we're expecting to achieve, and this is where some of the milestones can be interrupted or delayed temporarily, thankfully. Um, we want to always be aware of what a normal child development is, so we're also not conveying unrealistic expectations for a child. And then be aware of what the barriers are to enabling some of that related to the diet. So adolescence, separation and individuation, that autonomy formation of identity in terms of how you reconcile that you have a medical condition and how that doesn't become the primary piece, and eventually launching. And really everything that comes before launching is to set someone up to be able to be independent, read their own labels, not live at home, not depend on mom or dad to do all of the grocery shopping. I'm not going to go in depth into the different age groups. I did just want to highlight that as kids grow up, our focus on what we want to promote and what we want to be mindful of in terms of the medical interventions changes. So with pre preschool age children, we have to remember that there isn't really an ability to understand parental lack of parental protection. So these are the kids who don't understand why mom or dad is letting us draw blood or letting us do an endoscopy. Um, there's a tremendous amount of magical thinking and associative logic. Thoughts are very concrete. Um, and there's this causal link between physical and temporal proximity. So there's no way to differentiate um, that something happened due to a, a kind of timeline of medical issues in a preschooler's mind. 
School age, primary task is mastery. There's the fear of bodily harm, and this is where you start to see the kids who maybe prior had done really well with some of the medical interventions or been very adaptable to the diet start to have tremendous anxiety because um, they become afraid that the blood draw will lead to loss of all blood, or they'll be afraid that if they ingest gluten, it will be irreversible. School age children, we want to start to create rituals for them around eating and around the diet, and this is where choices become much more effective than a reward system, which is usually more effective with younger kids. And modesty makes an appearance here. This is important, certainly, because um, we want to be mindful of the way the, you know, the examinations go um, at the, in the doctor's office, the way the body image is developing. You have increased reasoning skills, which can be very helpful with a lot of the cognitive behavioral work in terms of coping. And adolescence, peer pressure certainly is the, is the biggest construct. There's this acceptance of dependency that many of the teenagers have to have in terms of their parents making a lot of the choices about the food. And so it looks to us like they're trying to sabotage treatment often, uh, but really it's this reconciliation, it's this constant push-pull. And the cognitive advances at this stage are both kind of an asset and a liability. You can have a lot greater resentment of the situation you're in, but it also allows us to do a lot more work with abstract coping. And young adulthood, you're charged with life skills, physical launching, often you become financially independent. You have to learn to advocate for yourself. You have to manage peer pressure. You have to know the difference between ingestion and cross-contamination and all those risks. This is a tremendous charge. Um, and so at any point, we could see an interruption to this if the things that came before haven't been promoted. I want to touch on the construct of temperament because this is relevant to how we would help a family manage the day-to-day -day hassles. Temperament is a biologically based construct. So it is believed to kind of be inherited. It is from when time you're born, and it is pretty stable across the lifespan. So a child's temperament, or even a family's kind of temperament in the household, can help us to understand how a child would react and behave in certain situations. And then it helps us to work with the child, as opposed to trying to change the child's response to the diagnosis or the diet. We want to consider the degree of fit between a child's temperament and the environmental demands. So the temperament might vary from child to child or patient to patient we're seeing. The environmental demands won't in that celiac will remain stable, the, the learning pieces of that, the facts around what needs to happen. The traits of temperament, it's a, it's a much more layered construct, but to boil it down, form basically three types of temperament. You have easy and flexible, difficult and slow to warm up, and I'm sure we all know people who fit into these temperaments. And so what we want to do is consider these temperaments. Um, we want to consider these temperaments when we're looking at how we want to educate people, um, both themselves in terms of how to negotiate the facts of celiac and how they're going to educate the people in their lives about what needs to happen. So the, the reason temperament, I think, is such an important piece here is it is directly linked to how we're going to frame what needs to happen for a family and how, the, how we can help a family frame to their loved ones or other people in their life what needs to happen for them to help the family stay safe. Um, explaining celiac can be very complicated. We want to try to do a really good job from the start in explaining it to the family so that they feel armed with the tools to explain it to others. We want to make sure that we're always providing information that can be used, so this increases with age. But the younger children can't use most of the information, and in that case, it's going to really just spill over to anxiety. So we really just want to focus on the facts of why they're eating certain food, what's happening in their body that we discovered that helps us know that we figured out how to keep them safe. We want to make sure the children always know what their responsibilities are going to be and what the parent's responsibility and the adult's responsibility will be. We want to make sure that at every age, the child has a reliable source of information. For many years, that is the parent and the doctor and the medical team. And over time, it becomes support groups, websites, peers. We want to make sure we're revisiting education at every developmental stage. And this is something that is hard to do, especially if someone was diagnosed at age five. You think, well, they've had it for years. They've grown up with it. But as they grow up, they experience the diet and the demands differently. And we want to make sure that kids know that there'll be more for them to learn over time. Um, and, and to make sure to keep asking the questions so we're charged with making sure that we're not just settling for basic information. There's a difference between direct caregivers and indirect caregivers, and so this just touches on that and how the level of information would change, the people who are in charge of the children. Um, logistical information, facts about celiac, the type of language you could expect a child to use so that a, a caregiver, a babysitter, a teacher is aware. Talking to teachers, which is a whole separate talk, um, which really involves often setting up a plan called the 504 plan with the school, making sure that the school's aware, 
uh, that the child has what they're entitled to within a school building. Thankfully, the food allergy and peanut allergy laws have set a precedent for this. Um, making sure that teachers know how to check food labels, classroom parties, things like that. And then there's the non-caregivers. And the most important thing for a non-caregiver to know is that this is not contagious. And beyond that, we usually just coach our families to say, you know, invite people to ask questions if they continue to be curious. Um, but general information is fine and getting out, you know, people usually want to know, are you going to be okay and can I catch it? And usually if you've covered that, most people are pretty satisfied. So in conclusion, we want to educate, we want to communicate, and we want to anticipate, and that's both within the family system and certainly within the community from the family. Thanks for your attention. Wow, so a credible amount of great information. I bet you have some equally great questions. Um, Carol has the microphone. Um, You want to just raise your hand, yeah, then she'll know to come around. Hi, my name is Kathy. I'm a graduate nursing student here, and I was just wondering if any of you had specific thoughts on celiac or allergies in relation to kids with autism. <laughs> So um, there's no relationship that's been documented between celiac disease and autism. Um, there is no evidence that a gluten-free diet helps kids with autism, but there are a few kids who have responded to a gluten-free diet. So if I see a child with autism and the parents want to try a gluten-free diet, I explain that I can't guarantee that this is going to work, but if they want to try it, we'll support them and teach them the diet so that they can give it a try. So um, it is kind of the same for IgE-mediated allergy. I do test some patients just because the parents really want to, understanding that there's a rate of false positive reactions. But to be honest with you, none of them so far have reacted. So usually their skin test comes back negative, so. Hi, uh, I'm Nancy. I'm a registered nurse. And I just wanted to know if um, any of the doctors know if there have been studies looking at the genetic engineering of our grains and if that would have any effect on the incidence of uh, gluten, in, uh, gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. Thank you. So, um, so there have been studies in attempts to um, engineer grains that don't have gluten in it and so far are toxic. The problem with those grains is you lose the characteristic for baking, which is the important thing, the elasticity, the viscosity, the chewiness that comes with this, you lose that. Uh, interestingly, over time, if you look at how people have grown grains, over time, grains, the concentration of gluten in grains has increased. We use grains that have more gluten in them over time, and that's the way things have gone. But that, what, what are the changes in our grains that have, have, have So that we use a tetraploid that have four times the genetic makeup, and they make more gluten per amount. So the amount of gluten has gone up over time. And this is over thousands of years. You know, as people have made better grains, it turns out that they have more gluten in them. And so far, the efforts to get rid of that gluten destroys the wheat functionality, unfortunately. I was wondering, what's the current medications for chronic uh, eczema, the topical medications, and uh, do they still use uh, steroid medications? Do they can cause a lot of side effects? Yes, so definitely I would first recommend an allergy evaluation, especially for kids. Um, it's less common to have allergies in adults, but still environmental allergies are still common in adults. So that's one important thing. And then hence the environmental control measures. So if it's dust mite allergy, I've seen kids improve a lot 
uh, once you do like the special covers for the mattress and pillow and all that. In terms of medications, well, first of all, moisturizing the skin is really important. So things like Vaseline, hydrated petrolatum, applying them regularly is really important. And then topical steroids, definitely. So we can start with low strength for areas like you know the face to higher strengths if needed, as needed. There are other ones uh, like Protopic, and it's kind of same anti-inflammatory effect as the topical steroids, but those are some of the other options available. Antihistamines, sometimes they can help with the itching, so we do prescribe it, but usually they're more effective for itching from hives than they are for eczema, so. Hi, my name's Casey. I'm one of the MP students here on, co on campus. And one of the questions that I had was, uh, you mentioned a little bit about socioeconomic status and teaching with um, the parents and that. Do you find that that truly affects whether or not they're able to adhere to the diet? And does that also cause them to not be able to understand exactly what it is you're saying? Um, I don't see a correlation between socioeconomic status and the ability to digest the information. I would say that the health literacy level, I've seen low health literacy levels with very high socioeconomic statuses. Um, the socioeconomic status, I do directly see impact the ability to adhere. I don't see it necessarily impact the motivation to adhere. I don't, I don't find families are less interested in getting better, but that the facts are simply that they, are, they do the best they can, which is not that they turn their whole house gluten-free. And that's a very individualized treatment. Some families will decide to go completely gluten-free. Some families will say, we are gonna have one family member who will be gluten-free, and everyone else is gonna eat gluten. And that can often predict the success um, in terms of the household. And, and I've seen it either way. Um, but I have seen many families who will start off with a uh, charge and be able to kind of spend all their resources to initiate this diet, and it's simply unsustainable. And it's often not until they're back for the follow-up visit where we can assess adherence, where they mention that you know they ran out of something in the house and their their next paycheck wasn't going to come, so they kind of limped along until that happened, and then it led to constant re-exposures. Are they able to get any type of um, funding or finances? Is there anything available, any funding or finances out there for yeah, those people that um, fit in those categories? It's a complete healthcare loophole. In fact, it's you know the the treatment for this disease is diet, and there is no. You, there's no insurance coverage for it. Mm -hmm. So often what we're doing is helping families with their literally going through their budget and seeing where we can reallocate, um, helping support purchase of household items such as toilet paper, paper towels, et cetera, so that financially with grants donations so that they can put that money towards the gluten-free food. Um, and then any family who has benefits through a job, encouraging them to use their flex spending account um, and put that money towards the purchase of gluten-free foods, which is allowed. That is an yes. option. There is also, um, in the state of Massachusetts, there's something, it's, it's got an unfortunate name. It's called the Catastrophic Illness Fund. And if you are under the age of 21 and you have a chronic medical condition that leads your cost of medical care to equal 10% of your household income, you can apply for this grant. It's reimbursement only, so the family still has to put the money up front. But if you keep all your receipts, for many families of a low SCS, 10% of their income is going towards gluten-free foods. And these are, it's not gonna be fruits and vegetables, it's gonna be foods that are the gluten-free equivalent of a normally gluten-containing item. So that is an option for some families if the ratio works out. I just wanted to point out that other countries actually do provide the benefit of uh, gluten-free diets for people. Um, so it's considered a health benefit in other countries. Uh, not necessarily. I believe Australia, or Australia does it, and they don't have national health care. Um, hi, I'm Eileen, and I have two children with celiac out of three, and they were diagnosed in June. Um, and my question is, this is kind of specific, but it was in regard to millet. Um, my, a couple of times I've messed up and given the regular wheat and my daughter would vomit. Um, and then she had a millet pizza that was advertised as gluten free and she had a violent reaction. And I went online and it said, uh, people wrote in and said, you know, if I eat millet, I have a much worse reaction than anything. So is it, is that 100% true that millet, children with celiac, um, millet is not something that celiacs will react to? See, that one of the problems is that 
Uh, we know that oats can be contaminated by wheat, but we ignore the fact that all these other grains are also potentially contaminated by wheat. So the best thing to do is to get grains that are certified to be completely gluten-free. The other problem, and one that's been quite controversial, so um, I think I'm going to name names. So this is sort of reverse. So California Pizza Kitchen came out with this big campaign how they're going to have gluten-free pizza. Uh, but they refused to change their procedures to avoid cross-contamination. So they started with a gluten-free pizza, and then in the kitchen it got contaminated. So a lot of the celiac groups actually boycotted California Pizza Kitchen until they changed their ways. So you must be careful about the contamination issue. While we're waiting, I have a quick question. Historically, with introduction of solids in infants, we had waited until six, four to six months, mm -hmm. and then they'd started with rice. Could you speak to, do you think that's still, well, how we should be advising parents, or would there be a better way to introduce in solids with not, not having um, cereals first, maybe? You mean in terms of food allergies? Food allergies. Food allergies. So, and then also with, with peanuts, some people feel it's the way if it's roasted versus boiled, there might be some difference. And then historically, we've been saying wait until age three. And I think we kind of feel we don't have solid evidence on recommending. So both of those, I would really love some guidance. <laughs> so I can, I can do the celiac stuff. So um, there was actually an experiment in Sweden where um, the doctors wanted to increase the protein content in infant formula. And so what did they add to the infant formula? Gluten. And what, they, what did they cause? They caused an epidemic of celiac disease early in kids. The data to date suggests that if you're going to introduce gluten into the diet, you should do it no earlier than four months. So, you know, some people push cereal earlier than four months. Probably you should wait to six months, and you should do it while the child is, is nursing. Now, there's another big scare that's hit the celiac population, and that's rice. Have you heard about this? Arsenic in rice. So it turns out that a lot of the rice in the United States, especially from the South, is grown on fields that previously had cotton, and they used arsenic in the pesticides on cotton. So our rice supply is, <coughs> is contaminated by some very small amounts of arsenic, and Consumer Reports has published articles saying the content is measurable. Nobody knows whether it has ever led to an abnormal uh, health consequence. So uh, new mothers are no longer using rice cereal as the first thing. Um, and if you are going to use rice, it's uh, actually the white rice has lower arsenic levels. You should use more water than is required when you make the rice. And if you can get rice from California or from that's imported, it has lower arsenic levels because it's really a US thing in the Southwest. So that's a little off topic. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to comment on your question about food allergy. The latest guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends waiting. It used to, children would start food so, or solids like rice cereal around four months. The recommendation is now to wait until well into six months before you start solids. And then do they say to start with, um, still, they always started with cereals? For yes, some, it's, it, it's still. So, that has not the, changed. Some of the pediatricians are actually saying to start with the green vegetables first, which seems odd, but you know, um, they have yeah. good luck. But well, regarding the vegetables, the oh, maybe there's a problem. oh. <laughs> no, no, I just going to say it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think there's any data, so it's just based on how well they think their patients are tolerating this stuff. Unless mm. there is a, a risky thing, are legumes riskier? 
Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily so, but the peanut allergy question, I was going to address that. Yeah. So we used to say to delay that until they were three. Then other studies came, because there were studies suggesting that that might help preventing peanut allergy. And then other studies came out that suggested early introduction may actually induce tolerance while the children are younger. In my patient population, I've seen both. So what I tell, meaning, uh, patients avoiding peanut and still developing the allergy or introducing it early on and developing the allergy. So I really tell the parents that both studies are out there and I kind of leave it up to them depending on their lifestyle and you know how early they feel they want to introduce the peanut, but there's no longer the recommendation to delay until they're three. So. Yeah, I think one of the doctors had said in Africa where they boil, they make a porridge out of peanuts. If right. it's boiled, they have they have way less peanut allergy. I don't know if it's because of that or maybe it's a hygiene there. I, I don't know. It's, it's some interesting stuff mm -hmm. right, to think about, though. Um, and also, overall processed or boiled and heated peanut is tolerated better. There are newer studies uh, suggesting that there's this category of cross-reaction with tree pollen allergy. So some of the patients with peanut allergy, they really have what we call oral allergy syndrome, which is not allergy to the peanut protein itself, but it's cross-reaction with a tree pollen allergy. Allergy. So that is actually eliminated once the peanut is cooked well or roasted well. So now we have a specific IgE testing that not all insurance companies cover, and it actually assesses a specific Ig to ARA H1. And if that is high, that's a better indication of a true peanut allergy, let's say. Same thing with the tree nuts, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oral allergy syndrome, though, in general, it's more common for fresh fruits and vegetables. So many patients, especially with birch tree pollen allergy or ragweed allergy, they can be allergic to fresh fruits and vegetables, meaning they get like tingling of their mouth or tingling of their throat. It's very, very rare for this to progress to um, anaphylaxis. But then if they eat those fruits and vegetables cooked, then they have no problem, like in jams or, you know, cooked vegetables, so. Do they keep an EpiPen? We still prescribe the mm -hmm. EpiPen for them, but we tell them to only use it if a serious reaction actually does occur. It's easier to avoid fresh fruits and vegetables because you don't worry about cross-contamination. It's pretty obvious. So they're, plus, if they actually do ingest it, chances of their developing anaphylaxis is really, really small. So uh, we do give them an EpiPen, but also tell them the chances of their needing it is really small. What about organics? It doesn't matter whether it's organic or not. So it's just a matter of the protein being modified by cooking. So Just to add to that, um, children with any kind of an allergy like that, the pe I mean, the recommendation is to continue with an EpiPen for the school. So, I mean, it's one thing to be at home, but when you're in school and there's a child with an allergy, the recommendation is still to make sure that there's an EpiPen available in the school nurse's office, whether they use it or not, and whether it usually does not obviously lead to anaphylaxis, but the child may complain of a tingling feeling, okay, and sort of then the nurse is alerted. And many times what happens is the nurse does administer that EpiPen, and once that EpiPen is administered, the child is then, they are mandated, they have to call 911, and the child has to be followed up in the ER. It's, it's a process, but that's what the, you know, what the guidelines are. We have a question here. Uh, my name's Cheryl. I'm a registered dietitian with two oh. kids with celiac disease. Oh, well, and um, I want to make one point and ask a question. I, I found that I've reverted to buying um, name brand foods in the grocery store. I used to buy all store brands, but I've had a very, very difficult time calling companies and finding out, um, you know, if there is any gluten in their products. It could take weeks or months before I get an answer. And I point out to them that people are trying to make the food for dinner that night. It's been very, very difficult that way. Um, my question is, when, if ever, will there be routine TTG testing in this country? <laughs> that, that's a great question that's being debated. So um, should we test everybody in the population and cover the bottom of the iceberg, all the people who have silent disease, 
and uh, what's what's gonna what's gonna evolve. Um, it's controversial because nobody has demonstrated that a patient with uh, an adult with silent celiac disease has a bad health outcome. Uh, we no, there there's not data that somebody who's got mild enough celiac disease that it hasn't caused them symptoms does any worse. A part of that may be because we haven't studied that population for a long period of time. In kids, we don't take that chance because they have a whole life ahead of them and we don't want them to have complications. So, you know, it's very actively being debated. It's the risk benefit of the cost of doing this and what would be the benefit. And a lot of adults that have no symptoms that are diagnosed with celiac disease, many of them elect not to go on a gluten-free diet despite um, knowing the complications. What about issues of infertility? Um, I, I wonder if maybe um, gynecologists and obstetricians should test routinely. Oh, they do. So if you go to an infertility clinic, they do test. Uh, but that's testing for a symptom, right? So uh, they're, they're not going to test everybody who's, who's in their practice who's trying to get pregnant, but the people who have difficulty, they're going to test. But that's based on the symptom of having difficulty. Controversial. Hi, my name is Jessica. I've had celiacs for about eight years now. My question is, does every person with celiac have another autoimmune disease, and does it go away with a gluten-free diet? Because upon my diagnosis, I had two other autoimmune that came about. One went away, and one remained. So, um, if you get a certain kinds of autoimmune, so let's let's start from scratch. So there is an association with other autoimmune diseases. Interestingly, it is much more common in a diabetic to make the diagnosis of celiac disease afterwards. Uh, it's rare for patients with celiac disease to get diabetes afterwards. Um, the thyroid problems usually don't go away. Diabetes usually if it's type 1 diabetes, doesn't go away. Other things like some of the joint symptoms or the skin manifestations may go. Ray nodes? Yeah, has that gone away or is it? Yeah. So, and it may or may not be related um, to the celiac disease. I just have a question for you while you're addressing that. What's the, would you just explain the difference between gluten allergy or gluten sensitivity, please? Uh, well, the, the, the three types. So celiac disease requires the specific genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. and you get that damage to the intestine with the villi going away. You get GI manifestations, and you can get extra intestinal manifestations. Gluten sensitivity, so people get symptoms, or often GI symptoms, when you eat gluten but it does not cause the damage, and it does not cause the slightly higher risk of other autoimmune diseases or other things. So if you have gluten sensitivity, in my, in my practice, you don't have to be as compulsive about the diet because you're not gonna damage your intestine, and you're not going to have an increased risk of complications. If you take a little bit of gluten and celiac disease, you're going to set yourself up for complications down the pike. Wheat allergy is a food allergy. And you've heard all about uh, food allergy from the other speakers. Um, it's more common in kids than it is in uh, adults, but it's mediated in a different uh, fashion. So it has more of the allergic symptoms that you've heard about. Hi, I'm Laurel. I'm adjunct faculty here. Can you describe um, the resolution of allergies? 
and how you know science you know what's the science be between kids growing out of a milk allergy if, is there any predictability about that or do you just reevaluate with a food challenge every year um, yes so we reevaluate them every year or so now we know that about 80% of kids with milk allergy and egg allergy can tolerate egg in baked goods or milk in baked goods and there are ways we can assess for that uh, based on the reaction in the blood work, the specific IgE and the skin test. And then we schedule them with what, with what we call a baked milk challenge or baked egg challenge. And then if they can tolerate it, we actually encourage them to keep eating that. And then those kids, they are the ones who are more likely to outgrow those allergies. But also when the levels are lower, both in terms of the specific IgE and skin testing, uh, then we know that they're higher, I mean, that they may have outgrown it. And at that point, we schedule them for what we call, you know, a oral challenge. So they come in and we observe them eating the food. So um, there's no way to know for sure who's gonna outgrow. Those kids who can tolerate egg and baked goods and milk and baked goods, yes, they're more likely but we don't know for sure, and we just check them every year. But we do see kids outgrowing it later and later, because uh, we used to say if kids haven't outgrown it by the age of five, that they're not very likely to outgrow it, but now we know that they can outgrow it when they're older. In fact, now we're seeing this subcategory of kids who have increasing IgE levels and skin test reactivity until they're about six or so, and then they start having lower levels. <coughs> Hi, I have a question. Is there any documented um, relationship between mental illnesses and celiac disease? Uh, yeah, I'm going first. Janice is going second. I just looked at her. It's, uh, the answer is yes, in the sense that a lot of kids with behavioral uh, problems may that may go away when they're on a gluten-free diet, but there have also been reports of major psychological illness, psychosis, even schizophrenia, that have gone away with um, a gluten-free diet and been related to celiac disease. I'm gonna tell you that's an aberration and a very unusual thing. You shouldn't expect that celiac disease is gonna cause that kind of uh, symptoms. Uh, Janice, what about depression and celiac disease? Mm -hmm. Right, that's what I was going to speak to. On the other side, um, if we look at mood disorders, there's absolutely a relationship. Um, and it's not actually s specific to celiac, it's specific to chronic illness. Um, but celiac certainly has been studied in that context. Um, and there is a higher rate of both subclinical features um, of depression and anxiety, mostly internalizing behaviors, not a lot of mania. We don't, there's not a lot of research to substantiate mania as an adjustment mood disorder, um, separate from any mental illness that might be a manifestation of untreated celiac. So I'm talking about you know once the diagnosis is, is made. Um, and there is there are rates double those seen in the community of major depressive disorder with at least two major depressive episodes um, for anyone under the age of 18 who has had a chronic illness. Um, and celiac has been included in the studies for at least three years. So um, I, I wouldn't categorize that as major mental illness, but certainly mood disorders that have warranted treatment for quality of life purposes. <laughs> one, one more question, yeah. You can go, well, I I've just, I've just, go ahead, I will address it as well, okay. go ahead, because I. Uh, you know, in cases of severe anaphylaxis, or kids who are highly, highly allergic, sometimes we don't write for the Benadryl order, just because Benadryl does not prevent anaphylaxis. So we just want to avoid the confusion. But if, so it all depends on what the reaction was, the level of sensitivity is, and how comfortable the parents feel with the school nurse and their knowledge. So I always say, Thank you. 
It's basically to avoid the confusion that Benadryl is going to avoid uh, is going to prevent anaphylaxis. Basically, that's all. So even in the cases when we do allow Benadryl, we make it very clear only for a few hives. Anything more, it has to be EpiPen. Now. If they want to give Benadryl in conjunction with the EpiPen, that's fine. But we just want to make sure that they don't delay EpiPen administration. And along with that, I also wanted to mention the reason uh, we ask them to call 911 whenever EpiPen is given, and we want to clarify that to the parents. It's not because EpiPen is going to cause any harms. It's because the reaction was significant enough that the kid is going to need observation, regardless of whether EpiPen was given or not in an emergency setting for at least four hours, because we want to make sure we're covering the delayed reactions and also the need for additional EpiPen, EpiPen administration right. in case of severe reactions. Yeah, no, she covered. I mean, I was going to say that. <laughs> I didn't have to say anything that was fine, no, but I was going to just say the same things. Well, right. I want to thank our distinguished speakers. I really enjoyed a lot of great information. I think so. I think so. <laughs>